All right. Hello. It looks like we are for the first time in MacGuffin history live, um, which is super exciting. Um, there, there have been so many bizarre technological hurdles that this magazine, which was formerly only doing things on pen and paper for the longest time. Um, so it's wild to see this all come together. Uh, so we are Today, hosting a reading uh, in celebration of volume 37.3, which dropped, I don't know, a month or two ago now. Um, so we have uh, eight, I think, readers, if I'm counting right. Eight readers uh, who are going to share their work today. Um, and we're glad that if you're watching out there that you were able to make it today, or if you're watching this after the fact, we're glad you're tuning in. Um, to kick things off, we're gonna throw it over here to the boss, Kathleen McClung, who has a few opening words for us. Thanks so much, Gordon. Uh, I'm Kathleen McClung, um, serving as guest editor this year. I'm zooming in today from sunny San Francisco. It's a beautiful winter day. And just to share with you all, the MacGuffin has been publishing three print issues a year since 1984, longer than some of my students have been um, on the planet. So I'm really proud to serve as guest editor and to work with managing editor Gordon Krupski and our amazing team of um, poetry editors and prose editors we have seven poetry editors scattered all around the country and seven prose editors also scattered around the country um, in Michigan, on the West Coast, on the East Coast, and sort of all points in between. It's a delight to work with these folks via submittable, via Zoom, via email. Um, and it's a delight to, um, to read submissions from people all around the country and, and often internationally. Um, our submissions are open um, through Septem from September through June um, every year. We take a little break in the summer and we accept poetry and prose, nonfiction and fiction. So check out our website for all of the submitting guidelines. Um, also check out our website for information about subscribing. We are delighted to have subscribers all around the country. And as Gordon mentioned, today we're celebrating with eight uh, contributors to our most recent issue, which looks like this. Gordon held it up a moment ago. Um, and we're going to be hearing from uh, five poets and three prose writers. I'm delighted to have uh, everyone with us today. And um, I'm going to turn it back now to Gordon, who's going to be introducing each of our readers and telling you all a little bit more about each of the eight. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's readings. Thanks so much. Uh, so those who have watched our uh, previous uh, reading videos know that I always make this stupid joke about how I'm on the campus of Schoolcraft College and it's very empty on Sunday. Um, but today, as luck would have it, there is a what well, looked to be a Taekwondo class happening uh, across the hall from me. So if you hear anything, uh, that that's what that is. So <laughs> without further ado, uh, we're going to kick it off with Lucy Zhang. Uh, Lucy writes code, writes codes and watches anime. Her work has appeared in West Branch, Thread Count, Superstition Review, and elsewhere, and was selected for Best Microfiction 2021 and Best Small Fictions 2021. She edits for Baron Magazine, Heavy Feather Review, and Pithead Chapel. Find her at uh, koartasakai.wordpress.com or on Twitter at dango underscore ramen, which we will put that in the chat so that you will be able to find it and not try to decipher what I just said. Lucy, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. So I'll be reading Trigger. This is on page 25 of the physical copy, and it's slightly shortened to accommodate the time. Trigger, suicidal grades. E failed the first pre-algebra quiz of the year. He was a big personality. He'd always make sassy remarks in class, pretend to know everything yet hem and haw when we asked how he knew. By fail, I mean he got an 80, optimistically an 85. I had gotten a 70. Maybe because I mixed up my order of operations or took the distributive property too literally 
or didn't check over my work. When Mrs. H handed out our papers during morning meeting, he cast one glance at his red grade in the upper right-hand corner, which I also glimpsed because we sat next to each other thanks to our shared Zhang last names and proclaimed, ah, I'm going to kill myself. Sure, if your parents don't kill you first, I thought. Mrs. H was an old woman who liked to bring crispy on the outside, soft on the inside blondies for our class. She was all smiles, exactly how you'd imagine a doting grandma. And she even gave us extra credit opportunities. But when she heard E's remark, she said, E, you cannot say that, and sent him to the guidance counselor's office. We were all a bit scared by how her face and tone changed, how quickly adults could go from kind to terrifying. I wasn't entirely sure what the guidance counselor could do about it anyway, or why it was such a huge problem to begin with. Didn't everyone say that? I'd feel like dying if that meant avoiding my dad's knuckles once he saw the grade. Kids who performed so badly needed to get their parents' signature, an acknowledgement of their kids' shortcomings. That's probably when I first forged my parents' signature. He returned to class in the afternoon, noticeably more subdued. I internally thanked him for his sacrifice. What an art it was, I thought, not to send trigger warnings to adults. Instagram. I deleted Instagram and LinkedIn from B's phone. He was always staring at his rich friends' houses, mentally sizing up their accomplishments, stalking coworkers, or coworkers of coworkers, or friends of coworkers on LinkedIn, who was in grad school and who was in industry and who was promoted, speculating about their restricted stock unit grants and assessing their universities and degrees and relationship statuses. B once had a taste of that life. One of his previous girlfriends came from a wealthy family in China and invited him to an insanely expensive restaurant with the whole room reserved. These are the three elements of international Chinese students, my dad had told me. Number one, hot pot. I couldn't understand why Little Sheep and Heidi Lao were so much more expensive here than in Beijing. All you needed was a, bo a boiling pot of water and raw meat. Two, fancy car. B spent as much time watching YouTube videos of motionless BMWs and Mercedes and Porsches on rotating platforms as he spent watching Twitch. Three, Canadian goose down jacket the type priced at over 1K. These apps are bringing out your toxicity, I told him. B said I was the rational one in this relationship, unaffected by material things, inferiority complex non-existent. He grew up thinking getting good grades and working hard meant he'd become a billionaire. The world isn't like that, I said. Work ethic isn't enough. He didn't respond. I had a habit of not saying what he wanted to hear. At first, I tried scrolling through his Instagram and muting all the people he followed. I passed a lot of images of half-naked girls, the cutesy tiny ones with narrow hips and even narrower waists to create the illusion of curves like you'd see in J-pop or K-pop idol groups, or cosplay models wearing school uniforms and cat ears. It's the fat distribution in East Asian faces, I told him. That's why they still look like middle schoolers. That was also why it was hard to tell who was starving and who wasn't. And it, it didn't show on the face until too late. Even then, you might still have a doll face impaled on a toothpick body. B was showering while I, while I muted those accounts, although I ended up spending more time staring at images of women than silencing notifications and stories and posts. At some point, Instagram started displaying an error while I tried to mute another account. So I deleted the entire app, perhaps more for my good than B's. Rice versus congee. When my dad would return home from work, he'd kick off the rice cooker with three scoops of short grain cocoa rice. He'd steam fish, cook broth with pork bones bought from Da Zhonghua, an Asian grocery store now out of business, and toss bok choy or napa cabbage into the broth to make soup. According to him, ShopRite sold fresher but more expensive fish, so he'd stop by ShopRite once a week to buy bronzini or sea bass, and steam it with scallion, ginger, and soy sauce. He ate in an unabated pattern of pushing rice into his mouth with chopsticks, picking a bit of meat and vegetables from the family style dishes, and then more rice. He washed his meal down with a ladle of soup. By this time, the rest of us would be around halfway done with dinner, and he would never fail to remind us to finish everything before proceeding to the family room to continue watching his Chinese reality shows. My parents had stopped asking about my grades, I was doing fine enough on my own, earning A's and engaging in good clubs like robotics. 
I never paid attention to how my dad ate until I took the responsibility of cooking rice for dinner. Since school started early and ended early in the day, I was able to start the rice cooker before my dad returned home. I used three scoops of rice, aggressively rinsed four times so all the surface residue starch washed out in cloudy white water. I poured filtered top water until it reached one level above the three tick market. It was a game. How watery could I make the rice before it turned into kanji, before my parents yelled at me? For two years, we'd eat watered down over washed rice for dinner. I thought by adding more water, I could lower the calories, but it, then, it ended up making it harder to spit half chewed rice in my napkin when I thought my parents weren't looking. The soggy bits would soak through the fabric and into my fist. Once I could escape the kitchen, I'd spit the food out in a plastic bag full of moldy food in my closet. You're eating less than you ate when you're in kindergarten, my dad accused me. I ignored him. You think you can go to college? I won't pay for it. It will be a waste of money. You'd be too weak to study. You wouldn't be able to find a job. I ignored him. I discovered the ingenuity of kanji. Eight cups of water to one cup of dry rice, boiled until the water morphs into a viscous fluid. After 20 minutes in the Instant Pot on high pressure, kanji limbos between a state of water and rice, tipping the balance just enough to qualify as a meal. I'd scoop the bottom, most rice-dense parts, into a bowl for B, skim the surface for a ladle full of starchy liquid for myself, hot enough to warm me during the winter, never enough to fill me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. I really love that piece. If you are out there watching this uh, either right now or later and would like to read Lucy's piece in a physical form in this book, uh, you can find this issue uh, along with most of our other ones at schoolcraftbooks.com, which I will put a link to that in the chat and probably magically make it appear here in an edited video. Uh, moving on, um, we are going to have next up Sandra Anfang. Uh, Sandra is a poet, teacher, and editor. Her poems have appeared in Rattle, The New Verse News, The MacGuffin, Spillway, and numerous other journals. Her books include Looking Glass Heart from Finishing Line Press in 2016, Road Warrior, Poems of the Inner and Outer Landscape from FLP in 2018, and Xylem Highway from Main Street Rag in 2019. She's been nominated for a Best Short Fictions Award, Best of the Net, and a Pushcart Prize, and has won numerous awards, most recently in the Soul Making Keats and the San Francisco International Haiku Contest. She hosts Rivertown Poets and teaches poetry to children. More can be found on her website, sandraanfangart.com. Thank you, Gordon. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Great. I'm going to read my two poems. The first one is called Little Black Dress for Roxanne. Consider the little black dress, equally at home at seductions and funerals. At the Goodwill store, they multiply on hangers, cast-offs from family wakes no one wants to remember, or hookups that went south, like sagging breasts whose weight still rests in tired silk. At my sister's grave, I bloom like a hothouse peony in purple floral silk among the blackened sheaths. You look like a little girl, my cousin whispers. I want to celebrate my sister's love of growing, colors do -si doing like dancers as the wind rustles my skirt in the cortege. During the service, my mind mouths, there they go, that rogue couple, love and death. My younger sister and I grip hands as we ogle the yawning maw grave diggers poised on their shovels, while tears of disbelief sprout from our eyes, watering the stunned and famished earth. Thank you. And my second poem is called Elijah. We set the Passover table. My father has hidden the afikoman. I am the youngest, so I will ask the four questions. I have many, but they are not in the script. Why is this night different from all other nights? We answer in unison, reading from our Haggadahs. I like the ritual of the Seder plate, the recessed image where each food rests. My eyes tear from the bitter herbs. 
I'm scared by talk of animal sacrifice and blood on the doorposts. The burnt egg and haroset are my favorites, a symphony of apples, walnuts, and wine. We've set a place for Elijah. After the main course, someone rings the bell. It's the paper boy. We invite him in. Dessert is fruit compote with macaroons. The next year, Elijah is a homeless mother, babe in arms, two shy children hidden in her skirts. I arch the screen door wide and fetch my mother's afghan. We bring the children grape juice and berries, squares of matzah heaped with jam. Sometimes Elijah wears an addict's clothes. My eight-year-old mind works hard to picture him sleeping in an alley across the tracks. My father called him a Vietnam vet with PTSD, whatever that is. He nearly died for his country, and this is how we repay him. I bring my father's pipe and fetch the lighter I'm not supposed to touch. I cull the fragrant spice the way my mother ushers in the Shabbos candles with a circular motion. I build a nest of pillows round his shrunken frame, heap a plate with fricassee, red potatoes, green beans, try hard not to stare as he gorges the frenzied animal of his jaws. Elijah visits us in many guises. I am no longer the youngest sibling. Soon it will be my unborn sister's turn to open the door and ask the tough questions. Old enough to be a grandmother now, I know that we are all Elijah. I remember how we opened doors for defeated men who wore their grief like a mantle, terrified to let the pain caress their skin. Even then I knew if they could slide their arms into the sleeves, they might burn through to transcendence. Thanks so much, Sandra. We're going to move on. We're going to stay in the realm of poetry for the time being uh, and kick it over to Liz Marlowe. Liz Marlowe's debut chapbook, They Become Stars, was the winner of the 2019 Slapering Hole Press Chapbook Competition. Additionally, her work appears or is forthcoming in The Bitter Oleander, The Greensboro Review, Valparaiso Poetry Review, Yemisee, and elsewhere. Liz, take it away. All right, thank you. Um, the poems that I'm going to read are on pages 82 and 83. This poem uh, refers to Franz Stangl, who was the commandant of Sobibor and then Treblinka until uh, shortly after the Treblinka uprising. Franz Stangl orders the construction of a zoo for trapped foxes and two peacocks. Treblinka, 1943. Page one, Franz Stangl's vixen. Her eyes glowed red on the edge of the forest. Most good people fear the vixen skulk, diseases, bite. But when I opened my palm, revealing a mound of crumbs, she ate. It comforted me to give her sustenance, to keep her alive. Behind the chain link walls, I tame her wildness while she screams, human in the night. I once reached out to pet soft red fur, but she bared white, sharp teeth, ready to reveal the red under my skin. In that moment, I saw myself in her. Cage two, Sarah's cage. All our eyes dart in light after the blindness inside train. No one laughs in a cage. No one embraces the dark in a cage. Cages do not properly contain our wildness. It burns inside us. Behind that door, chitter turns to silence. Wildness disappears into mist. Sometimes littler ones hide under falling dead, still, able to be through and after the gas. Any living being will fight for one more breath, hide for it if necessary. I once saw them playing with our children awaiting gas, awaiting freedom 
from this place. In that moment, I wish to be a child again, to be deceived again. The second poem, uh, Sarah's Uprising, has a date on it, August 2nd, 1943, which is the date of the Treblinka Uprising. The maggot desires my flesh so much, he leaves his rifle out of reach. I want out so much, I draw a bomb with my finger on his skin, connecting his moles like a constellation. As I harden him, he shoves me into the corner, pants half down, larvae sticky skin, hot breath, so much steam, I could draw a revolver on a window. I never look into their eyes, but today I explore his clouds hovering, dark clouds hovering in the middle of it all, ready to spread. Fireworks become my freedom as one of our men sneaks in, grabs the rifle by the door, starts our war. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Really, a, really a pleasure to hear you read those ones. Next up, we're going to kick it back into the prose category uh, with Jihoon Park. Uh, Jihoon Park's fiction is forthcoming or published in Storm Cellar, The Forge Literary Magazine, Read Magazine, and elsewhere. He is currently an MFA student at George Mason University. He is from San Jose, California. And in a little bit of a flip with our uh, earlier prose piece, which was divided into sections, Jihoon's piece is just one big old paragraph. Um, so keep it, keep it interesting here. Uh, Jihoon, take it away. Thank you, Gordon. I'll be reading a pretty short flash fiction piece titled Chameleon. And I believe it's on page 23, although I'm reading off the PDF proofs that was sent out before publication. So it might be different, but okay, it is page 23. Chameleon, I wake up clinging to this tree branch in the great rainforest and before I can register the humid air, the howling of apes, the fluttering wings of birds, my memories are already fleeting away like distant images in a dream. Was it all a dream? Of course it was. Or I wouldn't be here hungry for a cricket, a mantis, whatever insect may crawl too close to my tongue. This tongue that feels so new and strange in my mouth, but so familiar too. In my dream, I sit in my dim room in front of the computer screen, the gateway between my body and my fans, lovers, loners, cheaters, chronic masturbators, all waiting for my feet. Yes, I remember my beautiful feet that they love so much. The special Korean foot cream that cost $50 a tube, nails painted the color picked by the highest bidder, and money came in with every picture I sent, that money, so useless here in the rainforest, in my dreams, paid for midnight pizzas, rent, biology textbooks, and student loans. Behind me coming up the tree trunk is a great anaconda. I change color brown, like the color of the branch that I am desperately clinging to. I don't know how I do it, yet it feels so natural, like shivering skin under a winter morning chill. I stay completely still, the giant snake approaching, and I feel fear, primal fear, that the anaconda will eat me, and I will never pass on the gift of life to offspring. But a portion of that fear is the stench of harsh sweat and vodka on his breath when my wrists were held down by those calloused hands, rush of intoxication hammering my brain. And I kicked him back, and he fell hitting his head against the sharp metal of the space heater a pool of blood forming on the bedroom floor. I left the fraternity house quick so no one would know. And when I stepped out into the night air, it felt like waking up from a bad dream. So refreshing and all details crisp, the night lights and passing cars blasting electronic music. And as if to reject this reality in favor of another, my stomach heaves and I threw up there on the sidewalk, disgusted at my own being wondering if there wasn't a different way to exist. And suddenly I'm on this branch, the anaconda now brushing up against my tail. And on nearby trees are other chameleons, all turned to the color of their branches, 
or leaves or whatever they're gripping, gripping onto your life with their little toes. Won't any of them save me? No, they will simply blend in and become nothing. And I wish I could become nothing too, but I am not like them. I have great dreams, dreams that pull me back and forth. And I wonder if I'll ever really go back. Maybe if I fall asleep, I'll wake up from this dream and enter the next. I see a small aphid crawling on the branch in front of me. And by instinct, an instinct that feels so new, but so familiar, my tongue whips out and snatches it into my mouth. The anaconda sees and lunges at me, barely missing my tail. The branch snaps, we fall, and I wonder who I will be when I hit the rainforest floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, June. Really, uh, really powerful piece there. Uh, big fan of that one. Uh, so we're at about the halfway point of today's reading. Uh, so I just want to take this opportunity to plug the old website here and remind you that if you are interested in supporting the magazine or reading more work by any of these people, you can check us out. Uh, volume 37.3 is what all the work today is coming from. You can find that online at schoolcraftbooks.com. Uh, New issues running about nine bucks right now, or not about, it's exactly nine bucks. Uh, back issues are going to be seven. Um, we also have yearly subscriptions, uh, which are three issues right here uh, for 20 bucks. Um, so do stop over there and check it out again. That's schoolcraftbooks.com. And I will throw a link in the description. Uh, we're going to kick it back to poetry now um, with Vince Gutera. Vince Gutera was editor of the North American Review and Starline uh, Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association. Poetry collections include Dragonfly, Ghost Wars, Fighting Kite, and The Coolest Month. Uh, recent poems appear in Crab Orchard Review, Ekphrastic Review, Philippines Graphic, Rosebud, Multiverse, and Hey Naku 15. Uh, you can find his blog at The Man with the Blue Guitar. Vince, take it away. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, the first poem, I have two poems. The first one is on page 44, for those of you who might be reading along. This is called Observing the Medical Examiner at His Job. She lies quiet on a brushed steel bed, her lashes frozen in feathered sleep. Fluorescent lights caress and kiss the why filleted between her breasts. Her arteries and veins sliced pump nothing, not even ooze. Organs, lungs, heart, yards of intestines, autopsied, removed, and filed away in a plastic bag. Glacier is what I make my mind, my head. I'm ice, I'm stone, I don't dare blink. Can't imagine my chest like hers splayed open. The body, an envelope, a sack, a hole. Well, I saved the other poem for later because it's a little happier. Um, and it is on page 10. Uh, the, poem is, uh, is, the poem is titled Rock and Roll. I think back to playing guitar and singing covers in dance bands some 50 years ago. Teenage dancers and hangers on crowding the stage. Bob Seeger sang, out there in the spotlight, you're a million miles away. And I recall that feeling precisely. The slight buzz of the amplifiers and undertone to the band's groove. Booming bass guitar below the shimmer and snap of cymbals and snare and me riding that glimmering wave of sound, my voice surfing like a silver alien towards some horizon inside the mind, somewhere deep within. That's why we do this. For those brief moments, when we lose ourselves in that deep wave that's both inside and outside us. Everyone in the place can feel it, locking into the wave, all swept together somewhere else, all riding together like a whole city in a spaceship in the invisible metallic vessel of a lone guitar chord. Thank you, Vince. 
Uh, next up, we're going to move over to the pro side of things one more time. Uh, Max Kruger Dahl is going to end the pros selections for the day. Uh, don't go away, though, because we will have some more poetry after he reads. Uh, Max Kruger Dahl holds an MFA in writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts. His recent work has appeared or is forthcoming in Litro Magazine, Baby Teeth Journal, Yonia Review, and more. He lives in New York with his boyfriend and two dogs. Max, take it away. Thank you, Gordon. Um, this piece, I think, uh, is on page 110, um, and it's called Happy Birthday, Herskowitz. It's a semi-short flash fiction piece. Between the ages of seven and 13, my twin sister and I built our own vernacular and recorded the terms in a mini notebook that we kept in our dad's fireproof safe. Many inside jokes were included. We often spent a week or two perfecting the language of our definitions, sequestering a table during our after school program and reworking the phrasing until we found an elegant or seemingly elegant string of words. In the end, we cataloged 312 entries. Entry one, TMC, too many clementines, an acronym to be used when Jessa or Matt has diarrhea or an upset stomach. Jessa and I began using this term the day she ate an entire pouch of clementines before school and shat her pants during art class. That day we were making ceramic mugs. I added swirls and peace signs to her clay after she hobbled to the bathroom to clean herself Jessa hated my modifications and threw her mug in the trash. Entry 239, spider bite, a phrase meaning mom's cigarettes, as in Matt, let's sneak another spider bite, or Jessa, I think I'm becoming addicted to spider bites. Jessa stopped using spider bites when we turned 15, but I never did. When I left home for Northeastern, I switched to buying my own cigarettes. Now at 35, I use two nicotine patches a day and soon hope to go down to one. Entry 80, air raid, meaning to fart. Entry 193, happy birthday, Herskowitz, meaning congratulations. Entry 71, grand mall seizure, a term meaning don't talk to me for at least 30 minutes, a request to be respected under most circumstances. In third grade, I had an actual grand mall seizure and several classmates thought I was turning into a werewolf. I felt hazy for half an hour after regaining consciousness. According to Jessa, she cradled my head as I jerked. I've always doubted her claim. For months, my parents worried I was epileptic, but a second seizure never came. Entry 103, Prozac, a term that at first meant mom's feeling sad but now means Matt or Jessa's feeling sad, as in I'm feeling Prozac today. We were only allowed to say Prozac inside the house. On our 20th birthday, our mother told us why. She'd been worried that we'd use the word too regularly in public and someone would suspect us of being addicted to pills. She'd had nightmares of us rested from home by DCF and sent to crowded orphanages. Now, mom takes some Balta instead of Prozac. Entry 33, one-eyed and two-eyed Hermans. One-eyed Herman is to be used when a person looks like a fish and two-eyed when a person looks like a bird. Entry 264, the LMB, the Linty Mothball, an acronym used to discreetly refer to Jake Stanley, a boy in Jessa and Matt's grade. I do not remember why we called Jake Stanley the LMB. We hated Jake, but he didn't smell or look like a mothball. He looked more like a one-eyed Herman. Jake often flicked my forehead when he passed me in the hallway. In gym class, he once tried to stick gum down my ear canal and mildly succeeded. During our middle school orientation, I heard Kim Longo use the acronym as she complained about Jake. Other kids started using it too. Eventually, Jake figured out what LMB meant. I'm certain the title irritated him more than he let on. Before rehearsals for Alice in Wonderland Jr., Jessa played the Mad Hatter, I played miscellaneous parts, including the Queen of Hearts' croquet ball. I asked my sister why she so carelessly divulged our name for Jake. Until then, we'd been the only people allowed to make use of our vernacular. 
Jessa kissed my cheek and said, unfortunately, Maddie, we're not the only two people who exist. Entry 312, water hurts, a phrase for when one cannot muster up energy to take a shower. This was our last entry. A month after we added water hurts to our mini notebook, our house caught fire from a cigarette, either Jessa's or mine or mom's. Only a third of the rooms got destroyed. After a week, the fire department cleared us to go back home and Jessa found dad's fireproof safe resting in the charred hallway outside of his scorched study. She looked inside the safe for our notebook but couldn't find it. We later learned dad had moved our notebook to his desk to make room for his mother's guitar pit collection. Our log had been destroyed. After we lost the notebook, I used to imagine the fire had moved so slowly that each of the entries burned individually. That image gave me comfort. In the days that followed the fire, all of our phrases and acronyms got sifted out of our vocabulary. We said bird when a person looked like a bird and cigarette when we craved a smoke. I often wondered why our vernacular shifted so quickly and, claim, and came up with only one plausible theory. When our terms were no longer written down, when the entries existed nowhere but in our minds, our language lost its gravity, our language lost its appeal. Jessa called me earlier today. We hadn't talked in eight months. I've been told this is quite unusual behavior in twins. She asked if I'd been cast in any commercials recently. I hadn't. I asked if she still worked at the same publishing house. I already knew she did. Instead of answering, Jessa giggled and said, TMC. What? I asked. TMC, she said too many clementines. Your stomach hurts? Yes, she said, my stomach hurts. TMC. Yes, Matt, I'm pregnant. I just found out. My stomach hurt, TMC. I congratulated her and longed for our childhood closeness. When the time came to hang up, I blew a kiss into the phone and said, congratulations again. Happy birthday, Herskowitz. Yes, Jessa said, her voice gentle. Happy birthday, Herskowitz. Happy birthday, Herskowitz to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max. Uh Really great piece and a uh, really great lexicon that has slowly been working its way into my own vernacular, especially air rate. That's a good one. Love that. Uh, <laughs> so that's going to conclude our prose selections for today. We've got uh, two more poets reading, though, so don't go away yet. Um, our second to last poet is going to be Susan Landgraf. Uh, Susan Landgraf was awarded an Academy of American Poets Laureate Award in 2020. The resulting book of Muckleshoot Indian Tribe Poetry will be published by WSU Press. Two Sylvia's Press published The Inspired Poet, a writing exercise book in 2019. More than 400 poems have appeared in Prairie Schooner, Poet Lore, Margie, Nimrod, Third Wednesday, Calix, Rattle, and others. Other books include What We Bury Changes the Ground and Other Voices. A former journalist, she taught at Highline College for 33 years and at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. She served as a poet laureate of Auburn, Washington from 2018 to 2020. And Susan, the floor or the Zoom, I guess, is yours. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Kathleen. And Thanks all the readers who have gone before and uh, Murray, you will bring up the last one. Uh, it's been a pleasure so far. Uh, I'll read uh, the one in the book that's first, page 46. He went to work at the state hospital. He was a big man filled with guilt and longing, but his touch was gentle and his voice like a pool, one woman said, she could soak in to escape the piranha. Some days patients broke out of winter into spring in the afternoon. The next morning, vacancy like a dead neon sign in their eyes. When a girl who never spoke pressed her palms against the barred window, he broke the rules and walked her out of the locked ward into the field. She turned like a spindle, pointed to the sun. He took her back to the ward, turned in his keys, moved to the other coast with his keyboard and scotch. He trekked the Olympics, 
slept with its arms wrapped around a rock, walked into the Pacific, was caught in the undertow, carried back in on a wave. He camped out on First and Pine, ate in the mission, worked in the soup kitchen, and was picked up on a sweep of First and Pike. He said he had this epiphany. Spring is the season most people are likely to break. He said he had this epiphany. He'd been the coal burning his father's hatred. He said he was everyone else. He went back to the hospital. After work, he talks with his keyboard. He turns bars into swallows, skimming the grass risen to leaf, stalk, bud, blade, a forest of trunks, elbowed limbs, and canopies filled with robins, jays, ravens, chickadees, sunlight playing photosynthesis. And the second poem is on page 130. New suburban development down the road. The woman of the house with its blue door fills the bird feeders, waters the peonies and chrysanthemums in her garden as the cat curls in the grass and a butterfly sculpture spins. She talks to the monarchs and chickadees, owl in the fir tree, crows in the pines and listens to the wind play their branches. She is attuned to these, the inhabitants of her kingdom, though she knows the meaning of transients. Hers are celebratory kinds of days, living the minute, the hour, she doesn't see it coming. Cat dead, her fall, the nursing home. She doesn't see or hear bird feeders taken down, the tree cutters and bulldozers, her garden paved over, and the leftover rusted butterflies stuck in the ground on a rod, burning the air with their soldered wings. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Susan. All right, folks, we got one more Murray Silverstein to close it out today. Uh, Murray Silverstein's books of poetry, Any Old Wolf and Master of Leaves are from 16 Rivers Press. He was editor for the anthology America, We Call Your Name, selected for Yale's Million Book Project an architect and co-author of A Pattern Language from Oxford University Press. Silverstein lives in Oakland, California. California, the official second home of the MacGuffin these days, it seems. Uh, Murray, it's all yours. Oh, thank you, Gordon. And what a pleasure to hear everything that folks are reading today, such beautiful work. I have two poems. Uh, the first is on page 48. Andres Schiff, after playing the preludes of Johann Sebastian Bach, Davies Symphony Hall, San Francisco. The hall was here before I played. So when I say I built the hall, think of the clay God scoops up, blows breath into, and it becomes a man, but space, not breath, a depth, not there before I played, that holds the whole place up the piano, my T-square for sounding the deep. Architecture, the soul's too free without it to do us mortal bodies any good. Born back to dirty silence as the G major fades. I tried to make it last, slowly lifting my hand, but people had to pee and catch a train. And the second one is on page 152, uh, entitled, So It Wasn't the Promised Land, which is a phrase I couldn't find look, trying to look for it again, but it was in a book called Poor Cousins, and it referred to the a kind of phrase in Yiddish that became common among uh, Eastern European Jews coming to this country in the uh, uh, 1900s, 1890s, after they'd been here a generation. So it wasn't the promised land. So it wasn't the promised land, but there were trees, there was water, 
and there was Betty, that waitress, dad called a flirt when she winked at me over pancakes. And there was, what's his name? Sanderson, yeah, with the bouncing Adam's apple who wrote on the blackboard, sorrow. And don't try to understand, he said, just put it in your mouth. I did, and it tasted like music. I do, and it tastes like dirt with the loamy deep darkness of figs and the earth in a dream became one blue eye staring alone into space, not the promised land, but there are stars. Thank you folks so much. And thank you, Murray. Uh, that I guess wraps it up today in under an hour, which is always, always nice. Um, that's what we shoot here for. We've never quite eclipsed that yet, which is okay with me, especially because I forgot to have lunch before this. So uh, don't forget, um, if you are interested in checking out all the work that you saw here today and more, uh, it's all available here in volume 37.3, which looks like this, uh, available today at schoolcraftbooks.com. Um, I think that about does it for me. If you want to keep up to date with us, you can follow us on Twitter now, uh, which is new. I don't think we were on Twitter the last time we had one of these. I know, crazy, right? Uh, our, you, can you can find us at um, MacGuffin1984, which is not uh, like dystopian or anything. That's just <laughs> the year we were founded. So, you know, <laughs> shockingly, just the MacGuffin was already taken. So what are you going to do? Uh, we're also on Facebook if anybody still uses that. So um, closing us out today, I think our uh, boss over here, Kathleen McClung, has some final words for us. My final words are thank you to these amazing writers. Um, it's just, just been a complete joy to listen to your reading. I, it was a joy to read your, your work on the page or on the submittable screen but it's even more of a joy to, to see your faces and to hear your voices. You know, during the pandemic, there haven't been live readings in rooms or cafes or bars or bookstores. Um, so we've had to do them on Zoom. And I'm grateful that we have that capacity to bring people together from around the country um, to, read, to read work and to, and to share your, your genius, share your brilliance. Um, so again, thank you to all eight of you. And a big thank you to Gordon Krupski, our managing editor, who has um, been part of the MacGuffin, leading the MacGuffin for 10 years. I think it's now maybe 11, because I've been saying this for the past year. Gordon is just a delight to work with and a superb editor. And I'm really grateful to have him as my colleague. So um, thank you again to everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are. I've certainly begun my day with, with great pleasure. So thanks again, everybody. Take care. For more information on the MacGuffin, a publication of Schoolcraft College, visit us online at schoolcraft.edu slash MacGuffin. Here, you can learn how to enter this year's poetry contest. Poet Hunt 27, judged by Los Angeles Poet Laureate, Lynn Thompson. This year's contest runs April 1st through June 15th. Entries will be accepted through Submittable, through an entry at schoolcraftbooks.com via email, and through the mail. Schoolcraftbooks.com, the official website of the Schoolcraft Bookstore, is your one-stop shop for all things MacGuffin. Simply navigate via the Shop tab to access the MacGuffin landing page. Click through to find Single Issues and, at the bottom of the page, one- and two-year subscriptions. 